welcome uh, to um, a marvelous event, uh, which I will say is also in a way for, for us a preview of a two-day conference that the School of Civic and Economic Thought and Leadership is hosting the next two days. Professor Freeman is uh, one of the speakers of 25 or so um, in our two-day conference on the theme of polarization and civil disagreement, which is uh, one of the highlights of a year-long series. I'm Paul Caris. I'm the director of the school. It's delightful to see all of you brave the uh, weather here and, and uh, join us. Um, so this is a, a separate event, uh, but also very much a part of the theme that we have been discussing uh, since September, and we have a few more uh, events after this two-day conference, uh, lectures in March and April as well. Um, because we believe in civil discourse and not force or violence, we don't require you to pick up all that literature that's out there on the uh, table and in the rack, but we do hope you will pick it up. Uh, all the dimensions of the school are covered in some ways. Our curriculum, we have a major and a minor, and a very busy public events, public affairs program. Um, I think we initially uh, advertised this to school teachers in the area, and so uh, especially for that, group, you should know that we, one of our uh, program elements is the summer uh, institute, summer sessions for high school students, week long in residence um, at the Barrett Honors College here at ASU for a, a, a very small. think it will work? I'll get the, the people. Okay. All right. Um, if you missed the last 10 minutes, teachers should pick up the flyer on the high school summer institute in June, mid-June. Um, now the important part to introduce Professor Freeman. Um, a professor of history and American studies at Yale University um, and one of the leading historians of the uh, early American uh, period in the 19th century. Um, her award-winning book um, uh, was one of the sources for uh, the Broadway star Alexander Hamilton and his uh, appearance in recent years through Lynn manuel Miranda. So the 2001 book, Affairs of Honor, National Politics in the New Republic. She's also the editor of Alexander Hamilton uh, writings in the Library of America series and also of the Essential Hamilton uh, 2017 from the Library of America. Uh, she has an uh, American history podcast uh, called Backstory, um, and uh, she's a frequent commentator in various uh, media sources. Um, she has a, an online course through Yale called The American Revolution, which is uh, viewed by many uh, hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, and her topic tonight is taken from her most recent book, uh, and the lecture is the title of the book, The Field of Blood, Violence in Congress, and the Road to Civil War. Please join me in welcoming Professor Joanne Freeman. It, it is okay. It is on. Thank you very much for that introduction and for having me. It's my great pleasure to be here this evening. Um, and I do indeed want to speak with you um, about the topic of my recently published book, The Field of Blood, Violence in Congress and the Road to Civil War, which tells the previously untold story of physical violence in the House and Senate chambers in the decades leading up to the Civil War. Now, I'm going to admit right at the outset that when I began this book 17 years ago, it was not quite as timely feeling <laughs> as it has come to feel in the recent past. So this has been a really interesting moment to come out with a book about extreme polarization in American politics and congressmen behaving badly, which is essentially what my book is about. What has remained consistent 
in those 17 years is the fact that throughout that entire time, I have seen that most Americans know about one violent incident in Congress, though they don't usually know the details. So when I would say to people over the years, I'm writing a book about physical violence in Congress, people would normally do this. Oh, there's that guy. So it's like, yeah, there's that guy. And of course, they're referring to the violent caning of Charles Sumner, abolitionist senator in 1856, while seated at his desk in the Senate. Now, Sumner gave a really powerful anti-slavery speech in which he attacked the South generally and a few key Southern senators specifically, men who had been attacking him for quite some time uh, in the debates over slavery. And a Southern kinsman of his, of one of the attacked congressmen, South Carolina representative named Preston Brooks. Ooh, do I get to put this down now? Yeah. OK. Are we still, oops, are we still hearing me? Yeah. Excellent. OK. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so a kinsman of one of the insulted congressmen, South Carolina representatives Preston Brooks, responded to Sumner's speech by going to the Senate chamber, telling Sumner, who was seated at his desk, that he had dishonored his kinsman, had dishonored his state, and then brutally caned him over the head until his cane broke. Now the book's title is actually taken from a response to that caning. Not long after the attack, a friend of Sumner's wrote that blood would flow, somebody's blood, before the expiration of your present session on that field of blood, the floor of Congress, I have fully expected. Now, as a historian, when you find a letter, when you're writing about physical violence in Congress and you find a letter in which someone refers to Congress as the field of blood, you think you sing hosannas to the history gods for sending you that letter. It's a remarkable thing to say. For this person at this moment in time, physical violence in Congress wasn't a surprise. He expected it. And he literally called the floor of Congress the field of blood. So that's the story that I wanted to tell in my book, and that's a story that hadn't yet been told. Americans certainly don't think of the antebellum Congress in that way, right? The Congress of Henry Clay and Daniel Webster, which we imagine as people wearing black frock coats and doing some version of this, right? This, this is how we imagine Congress. We don't think of the Congress that I'm going to be discussing with you here this evening. Um, there was a lot of violence in the 1830s, 1840s, and 1850s in the House and Senate chambers. Um, I found roughly 70 physically violent incidents in the pre-Civil War Congress. And I, I see surprised facial expressions, and I can tell you I was surprised as well when I began the book that I kept uncovering more and more and more of this kind of physically violent behavior. And by physically violent, I mean canings, shoving, fist fights, people pulling knives and guns on each other, duel negotiations, duels obviously were not taking place in the House and Senate, but there were duels as well, and occasional wild melees, usually in the House, with bunches of men rolling in the aisle, throwing punches, as well as a handful of street fights with fists, bricks, and the occasional umbrella. Now, I'll bet many of you are thinking some version of what I was thinking when I began working on this book, which is, that sounds like a very dramatic story, so why has it not been told before? Right? That's a very logical question. I asked myself that question many times when I first began this project, and there's a good answer. Most of the violence was essentially censored out of the period's equivalent of the congressional record. So there are clues in the record, which you would not notice unless you actually knew that the violence was there, and then you suddenly realize, oh, it's kind of hidden between the lines. So for example, every now and again, the record will say something along the lines of, the debate became unpleasantly personal at one point. <laughs> okay. Typically, that means that someone pulls a gun on someone or someone punches someone. That is unpleasantly personal. <laughs> but you wouldn't know that unless you knew what was going on around the edges. Or, as it says on another occasion, the record will say, there was a sudden sensation in the corner and nothing else. And in this one particular instance, two congressmen got in a fist fight. They flipped over their desk. That was a sudden sensation in the corner. So it's, it's between the lines of the record, but it's not apparent. And if you don't know that it's there, you're certainly not going to see it. 
every once in a while, as I mentioned a moment ago, there would be enormous brawls, and it's hard not to mention those in the record, but even those typically for quite a time would be mentioned in only the barest detail, as in the case of a huge fight in 1849 that was summed up by this wonderfully poetic way of describing chaos, and this is all it said in brackets in the record. The house was like a heaving billow, which I love the poetics of that. There's one empty seat up here, because I see people standing in the back, and, I, and, and actually you could sit in my seat too, so there's two seats up here. Come on up. Okay, yeah, come on and take seats. I hate to see people standing. Two seats, you're gonna be forced into the front row. <laughs> So that's the sort of thing that you see in the record. What you don't see in the record is the kind of detail offered in this account of a house fight that I found in a diary. And I'm going to say a little bit more about this diary in a few minutes. And this is just, I'm going to read you a few sentences as to how this particular person is describing what he saw in the house. During Thursday, another of those scenes so disgraceful to the House of Representatives occurred in that body. Mr. Wise had made some remarks to, Mitch, to which Mr. Stanley alluded in a manner that Wise thought malevolent and unkind. He went to Mr. Stanley's seat to remonstrate with him when angry words passed between them and Wise called Stanley, quote, a mean, contemptible puppy and miserable wretch. Now, those, are, that's, those are zingers for the 19th century. <laughs> to which Stanley replied, you are a liar. To which Wise <laughs> replied by striking him and a fight instantly ensued. Nearly all the members rushed to the spot where they were engaged. I was at the clerk's table where I could see and hear all that transpired. The speaker crying at the extent of his voice, order, 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 exclamations from the crowd of, damn with him, down him, down with him, where are your buoy knives? Order, gentlemen, for God's sake, come to order. Go it, Arnold, knock him down. <laughs> Mr. Clark, the clerk of the house, seized the mace and went into the midst of the melee and exclaimed, gentlemen, respect the symbol of authority. Respect yourselves. Okay, that is not in the record at all. It's in a diary, but not in the record. But that begins to give you a sense of some of what was going on on the floor, particularly of the House, but also the Senate. And the reason why it is not in the record has partly to do with the nature of the Washington press community in this period. In the 1830s, the Washington press basically consisted of a handful of men working for a handful of local Washington newspapers who sat in the House and Senate, scribbled notes, checked them with the congressman who had been speaking, and then published their accounts in newspapers and then also in spin-off publications that essentially acted as a congressional record. The newspapers that these reporters worked for were unquestionably and unapologetically partisan. So objective news is not on the radar screen at this point. So as a reporter, it was in your interest to make your party's congressman look good. It was also in your interest as a reporter to make congressmen look good because Congress granted government printing contracts and many a newspaper relied on those contracts for survival. Plus it must be said that unhappy congressmen occasionally slugged the reporter who made them unhappy. So for that reason too, you needed to please congressmen. So the Washington press in this early period had many reasons to smooth over the rough edges of what happened in Congress, which means that although the Washington press played up the bravado of many congressmen, they left most of the nasty details and the hard edges out. So why hasn't the story of congressional violence been told? Because it's exceedingly hard to find. If you're not looking for it, you won't see it. And I'm happy to talk during the question as to how I stumbled across it, which is quite literally what I did when I was beginning to cast about trying to decide what my next book was going to be about. Now that last wonderfully descriptive account of a fight that I just mentioned comes from a particular diary that I can't resist mentioning. And it's from the wonderful diary of a house clerk named Benjamin Brown French. And he ended up acting for me as a kind of a guide that took me and hopefully takes the reader through the violent world of the antebellum Congress. He was a minor clerk. He was from New Hampshire. He came to Washington 
sort of swept up in Jacksonian politics, moved in congressional circles for decades, and really ended up being a godsend for me because he kept a diary, an 11 volume diary, filled with his reflections and his thoughts and his feelings about Congress, and also filled with a good many accounts of fights. As he said to his brother at one point in a letter, he kind of couldn't believe his good fortune and that his job was to sit in front of the house and record what he saw. And some of what he saw was sort of stunningly bizarre to him. And his job was just to watch. I think he said something to his brother at one point like, I'm sitting here fresh as a daisy while Congress is engaged in this massive brawl. So his diary is full of some of that stuff and it's wonderful evidence. But more than that, What's particularly wonderful about French as an eyewitness to the behavior that I'm talking about here is that he undergoes a really remarkable transition over the time period covered by the book. He comes to Washington in 1833 as what would have been called at the time a doe-faced Democrat, meaning a Northern Democrat pretty much willing to do anything to appease the South and promote his party. And that means whatever it takes, it's fine, we'll appease them on slavery, whatever it takes, hold the union together and hold together the Democratic Party. So he comes to Washington basically eager and willing and actively trying to please Southerners. In 1860, he goes out to buy a gun in case he needs to shoot some Southerners. And my thought was in writing the book, if I can take readers from meeting this fellow who would do anything to appease Southerners in 1833, to being prepared to shoot Southerners in 1860. And if you can travel that journey with me and with French and understand what logic he follows that gets him from point A to point B, well then you're really gonna be getting at what I end up calling the road to civil war in a very different kind of ground level personal way. So French ended up being vital for that, it really gave me that kind of an insight in a way that I hadn't had it before. So by following French over the course of the book, you come to really feel how he and many Americans came to turn on each other. In essence, French enables me to explore what I call the emotional logic of disunion, the gradual process by which Americans learned to turn on each other to the point of violence. Now, not surprisingly, when you look at the violence that I'm talking about here over the 30-year period at the heart of the book, you see patterns. So for one thing, you see that the House was more physically violent than the Senate. And this makes sense. The Senate's members were often of a somewhat higher social status than members of the House. It was also a smaller body. There were more intimate relations between some of the people in the Senate. They tended to toss dual challenges towards each other and were less likely to just slug each other during moments of fraught politics. The House was far rougher, tending towards scuffles and pushing and shoving and wielded weapons. But in addition to that institutional pattern, there's another really striking pattern of violent outbreaks that's worth noting, and that's a geographic pattern. Generally speaking, congressmen divided their ranks into two kinds of men. And I'm gonna be offering you actual congressional lingo, which will be hard to believe, but it is actual congressional lingo. So congressmen broke their ranks into, quote, fighting men and, quote, non-combatants. They, they, at the beginning of a session, they would sort of evaluate who fell into each rank, which would give them some way to map the dynamics of the floor. Most fighting men were Southerners or Southern-born Westerners. They tended to be armed. They were more willing to fight man-to-man. -man. Southern culture, a slavery-grounded culture, was grounded on man-to-man -man violence. Most Northerners were non-combatants, which isn't to say that the North wasn't violent, because it was. But Northerners tended towards rioting, Southerners tended towards man-to-man -to -man combat, and that proved to be a useful skill in the United States Congress in antebellum America. Which means that, generally speaking, Southerners bullied Northerners in Congress, often to protect the institution of slavery. They insulted and threatened and sometimes assaulted Northerners to intimidate them into compliance or silence. And for a time, this strategy worked quite well. For a time, Southerners wielded an outsized influence on the floor of Congress and protected their slave regime in the process. And Southerners back home appreciated their champions on the floor. They might not know the dirty, nasty details of what their representatives were doing, but they knew 
that their representatives were fighting for the institution of slavery, and they liked it. So not surprisingly, Southern fighting men tended to get reelected. And a great example of this is someone who, um, in my book I call my most frequent fighter. Um, his name is Henry Wise, he's a Virginian, um, and he's not a, a sort of back alley brawler, you know, he's a sophisticated gentleman, he goes on to become governor of Virginia, he's educated, and he's also constantly rolling up his sleeves to throw a punch, right? So he, he's in the anecdote I started out by mentioning. And at some point, someone actually said, a northerner, stood up and said, Mr. Wise, you should be ashamed of yourself for what you're doing. You, you're constantly involved in these fights. You should be sent home. We should send you home. You should be expelled from this institution. And Wise responds and essentially says, just try. Just try. Expel me, because you know what will happen? I'll get reelected and sent right back here because they put me here to do this. This is what they want me to do. I am here to fight for their rights, and I will continue to fight for their rights. And he was right. Th this is an era of sort of one-term wonder congressmen. You know, there's a constant churning in Congress. People are there for one term and then leave. He was reelected six times. So he was absolutely right that his constituents supported what he was doing. They liked his bullying. They liked his behavior. And that kind of bullying had an impact. Sometimes noncombatants resigned from committees rather than be bullied. Sometimes they just chose to sit down and not speak up, knowing that they would be publicly humiliated and bullied if they got up and spoke against a Southerner. If they did, they risked what happened to one Democratic congressman in the early 1850s. So at some point, he insists, John Quincy Adams, the remarkable John Quincy Adams, who after his presidency goes back to Congress and serves in the House, um, and he's having his say on an anti-slavery petition and Southerners are trying to silence him and this one particular Democratic congressman, congressman says, no, 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 you know, you, he has a right to speak. Like, at least let him speak. And upon saying that, a Louisiana congressman stalks over to his chair and says, if you do that again, I will cut your throat from ear to ear. And he was wearing a Bowie knife and he made it clear that he could do that if he chose to do it. So you thought twice before speaking up and objecting to what a Southerner was doing. Okay, so with these basic patterns at play, you can begin to see why there was a good deal of violence and equally important, if not more important, intimidation in Congress in the 1830s, 1840s, and 1850s. But in the 1850s, things began to change. And in part, this had to do with the nation's expansion west and the rising problem of slavery on Western lands. Each state added to the Union put the question of slavery front and center, intensifying the nation's increasingly intense debate over slavery and polarizing national politics to an ever-increasing degree. At the same time as the nation's growth was keeping the problem of slavery front and center, a new form of technology, the telegraph, made matters worse by transmitting news around the nation with breakneck speed before politicians could spin the news as they saw fit. So as the slavery problem began to intensify, the telegraph spread that intensity around the nation with increasing speed and without much congressional spin. So just as the nation's sectional conflict began to fester, a new technology spread it nationally faster than ever before. And it would be hard to exaggerate the degree to which the technological innovation of the telegraph changed the nature of politics. And in a sense, the obvious thing for me to say is think about social media now and the many ways in which we're grappling with what it can do and what it should do and what it shouldn't do and how do we channel that and you get an idea of the way in which the telegraph in this period also scrambled communication between politicians and the public and people didn't quite know how to wrestle with it. There was a um, incident, a, a kind of a striking incident in the 18, I guess in 1850 itself that kind of shows you congressmen grappling with this moment. Um, and this is actually in the Senate, uh, and it's during the debate over what comes to be known as the Compromise of 1850, and one senator pulls a gun on another senator, 
Uh, and there's a, you know, I think someone calls it a stampede. You know, congressmen rush to the spot, some of them probably to calm things down, some of them probably to join in, some of them to pull the gun away. And it calms down, nothing happens, the gun is taken away, everyone sits down and they go back to go on with business. And someone stands up, actually a New Hampshire congressman, senator, stands up and says, before we continue on with business, I feel the need to say something. I hope everyone in this room realizes that because of the telegraph, in 45 minutes, the nation's going to be reading that we're slaughtering each other with guns in the Senate. And there's absolutely nothing we can do about that. And you can feel in the room that this sort of, oh, you know, there's, there's something is happening here with the technology and we really don't control that process in the way that we used to. So the telegraph really has an impact and the repercussions of it are severe. By framing the crises of that time for maximum impact, the press, with the telegraph fueling it, creates an endless loop of sectional strife. Congressmen issued rallying cries to their constituents from the floor, the press played up the implications, and the public responded by urging their congressmen to fight for their rights. And these extreme emotions were then broadcast throughout the union with ever increasing speed and efficiency. The product of this cycle of stridency was pronounced. By portraying Congress as an institution of extremes, extreme rhetoric, extreme policies, extreme belligerence, a den of braggarts and brawlers, a place of sectional conflict waged by sectional champions. The press basically downplayed the appeal and even the possibility of compromise. In more ways than one, the floor of Congress became a theater of conflict. And the deaths of Daniel Webster and Henry Clay in 1852 seemed to confirm the passing of some kind of a spirit of compromise. Violated pacts and talk of sectional plots joined with the very real bloodshed between Northerners and Southerners in Kansas pushed cross-sectional trust to an all-time low. As portrayed in the press, North and South were engaged in a fight but were not necessarily having a fair fight. And with newspapers connecting the dots displaying and deploring congressional threats and violence with full-throated zeal, public opinion of Congress began a real downward spiral of doubt that would continue for some time to come. With Americans already losing faith in the power and meaning of national parties, national institutions of all kinds were under fire at precisely the moment when their influence most mattered. Ironically, the workings of a free press enforcing congressional accountability, the very touchstone of democracy, was helping to tear the nation apart. The end result of these things, the rising intensity of the problem of slavery, the rise of the telegraph, not surprisingly, was more violence in Congress, particularly given that the American public was increasingly cheering on their congressmen to fight for their rights. And by the 1850s, this was true for Northerners as well as Southerners. As Northerners, again, partly because of the telegraph, began to get a sense of the degree to which their representatives were being silenced by bullying Southerners, they began to vote fighting men into Congress. The anti-slavery Republican Party came to power in the mid-1850s based on their promise to, to use their language, fight the slave power. Now that was the rhetoric that they used, but in Congress, working alongside Southerners, these Northern fighting men stayed true to their promise and fought the slave power in person with resistance, with fists, and occasionally with guns. As they said again and again throughout the mid and late 1850s, they would never be intimidated into silence by the slave power. Again and again during debate, Republicans would rise to their feet and insist. They were a new kind of Northerner, a Northerner who had been sent to Congress to fight. So you can begin to see why the mid-1850s and the late-1850s really becomes a period of extreme violence in Congress. These congressmen were being elected and urged by their constituents to fight. So they weren't isolated <laughs> champions in Washington their constituents were urging them to take that kind of 
action. And I found one particularly striking kind of chilling incident, and as always somehow with historical research, you know, it's like on a, the bottom of a newspaper page, clearly at the time it was not seen as being of any importance, but it, it, it uh, for obvious reasons, as you're about to hear, grabbed me and has stayed with me ever since. Um, and it, it talks about a congressman in Massachusetts, late 1850s, heading back, he's at the train station, he's heading back to Washington, and this little story says um, a group of constituents met him at the train station and gave him a gift to take back to Washington. And the gift was a gun inscribed with the words, free speech. <laughs> right, exactly. It's like a combination of laughing and sort of, ooh, <laughs> it's coming from you. And both of those, the totally valid response, right? These are people literally saying to their congressmen, take this gun back to Washington and fight for our rights of representation and our right of free speech. I mean, it, it's a chilling, chilling story, but again, it, it brings you into that moment and the, the power of what was going on at that kind of a moment. And fight, congressmen did. Their constituents told them to do so. They stayed true to what they promised to do. Now, let me give you an example of a fight between a fighting northerner and a southerner in these late years right before the Civil War. It took place in 1858. And it was particularly dramatic, and at the time, stood out for reasons that I'll, I'll mention as I tell this story. It happened during an overnight session. Overnight sessions were always a problem. They liked to avoid overnight sessions because congressmen would drink at dinner, and then they would go back to Congress. And so they were drunk and angry, and that was not a good thing. So they were inevitably, almost inevitably, if there was an evening session, something bad was going to happen. So this is an evening session. And in this case, there's a Republican with the wonderful 19th century name Galusha Grow who's from Pennsylvania. Um, and he was standing amidst some Southerners in the house when something happened on the floor that he objected to, and he out loud said, I object from standing amidst all these Southerners. So a South Carolinian named Lawrence Kitt, supposedly a bit tipsy after dinner, yelled out to grow, go object on your own side of the house. Don't object standing here amidst Southerners. Who do you think you are? Well, grow, fighting man grow, responded, it's a free house. I can stand wherever I want and say whatever I want. And I'm not going to take orders from some whip-holding slave driver. Thank you very much. <laughs> Those are appropriate sound effects. At this, supposedly Kit muttered, we'll see about that, and strutted over to Grow, grabbed his collar so that he could punch him. And Grow beat Kit to it and punched him, slugged him, and knocked him flat, hit him to the ground. At this, a stream of Southerners raced to the point of conflict, some of them probably to break it up, some of them probably to join in. Seeing this, a stream of Republicans began rushing across the house, jumping over chairs, jumping over desks to get to that spot so that they could fight alongside their ally, who at this <laughs> moment seemed to be swarmed by Southerners. And the end result was a mass brawl with scores of armed Northerners and Southerners running at each other and fighting in the space in front of the speaker's platform. The fighting ended only when a congressman grabbed another congressman's hair to slug him in the face, and his hair came off because he was wearing a toupee. <laughs> <laughs> and there are, there are all of these um, etchings of this fight because it was it got a lot of attention at the time, and there's always a toupee on the floor of, the, <laughs> of all the cartoons. So this man's hair came off, and it shocked him, and it shocked everybody else, and they actually began to laugh, and the fight kind of died down, and everyone sort of sheepishly went back to their seat. But what was striking about it, you know, there wasn't a lot of damage done. There were some black eyes. There was some torn clothing. What struck people at the time is there was an armed group of Northerners and an armed group of Southerners who ran at each other and engaged in conflict on the floor of the House of Representatives. Reporters at the time said it looked like a battle, which in some ways it was. So looking back at what I'm talking about here with the advantage of time, to some degree you can see where this is leading, right? But people at the time did not necessarily assume as much, right? They didn't know that civil war was coming right down the pike. I mean, this is always the, the joy and challenge of doing history is that you have to try to look through the eyes of your historical characters and trying to ignore the fact that you know a civil war is coming but that your characters don't 
that was a challenge in my working on this project. People at the time didn't assume a civil war was coming. And indeed, some of them just focused on the ridiculousness of the situation. There was an entire genre of congressional humor that broke out in the 1850s, making fun of this kind of behavior. There were sort of goofy epic poems that they were writing. There were cartoons of what was going on in this period. There's a humor magazine that's called Vanity Fair, which is not our current Vanity Fair, but there was a humor magazine that really was born at this particular moment. And for my own purposes, I tend to refer to it as Congressional Fights Quarterly because <laughs> It, it, that, basically, that's what it was. You know, it was like a, the, a humor journal, journal opens at the moment when violence is taking off, and it was just full of congressmen pounding each other in one way or another. The front cover of the first issue of Vanity Fair shows two congressmen throwing weapons and small animals at each other. On the, like, <laughs> that's the first issue. So there's this whole genre of humor, because people kind of can't quite believe what they're seeing, and there is some humor in it. But not everyone was laughing. A good many people, and Benjamin Brown French is one of them, became increasingly angry at people from the opposing part of the Union and increasingly concerned about the Union itself. And it showed in Congress. By 1860, most congressmen were armed, and many expected armed conflict to break out on the floor of the House or Senate like South Carolina Senator James Henry Hammond, who wrote a really remarkable letter in 1860. And you know, when you read books about um, the coming of the Civil War, they all tend to have a quote from this letter in them. And the quote says something like, um, you know, everyone here has a gun, and if they don't have one gun, they have two guns. And there's always a paragraph in books on the coming of the war that says, wow, it was getting bad, and they were armed. And here's a quote from Hammond's letter. Well. When you go and look at the letter, you discover the letter is remarkably revealing, not because of that sentence, but because of everything around that sentence. So Hammond first says in that letter, unless the slavery question can be wholly eliminated from politics, this government is not worth two years, perhaps not two months purchase. So far as I know, and as I believe, every man in both houses is armed with a revolver, here's that quote, some with two, and a bowie knife. And he considered it fully possible that the wrong words from a Republican could, quote, precipitate at any moment a collision in which the slaughter would be such as to shock the world and dissolve the government. He is predicting bloodshed breaking out on the floor of Congress. He goes on to explain that he went out himself and got himself a gun. He didn't, says he does, I don't like to carry a gun. I tried it once. I had to put it down. It made me nervous. I have one now. It's loaded. It's in my desk. And it's there not because I want to shoot someone, but because I'm afraid that I might have to. And what he says in this letter is, and it's stunning to hear, if armed warfare breaks out between North and South in Congress, he wanted to be armed and ready to fight with the South at that moment. He was expecting that moment to happen in the Senate, in the House. It's a remarkable kind of a statement. And that's the moment when Benjamin Brown French went out and bought a gun for the same reason. He didn't want to shoot Southerners. He was afraid that he might have to. Now, this is obviously a dire story. It's a story about extreme polarization, about conflicting visions of what the United States would be, about splintering political parties, about new technologies complicating the conversation of politics, about rampant distrust in national political institutions, and about rampant distrust of Americans in each other. It's obviously hard to miss some of the modern echoes between what I'm talking about and what we are experiencing at the moment. I am not saying I think we're headed into a civil war. I am not saying that. And I, every time I speak about this, I feel the need to say that very explicitly. What I am saying is that our nation has had moments like the current one, moments in which Americans feel like some kind of a decision is being made or some sort of pathway is being chosen. Some kind of decision about the nation's future seems to be on the line. And those moments tend to be ugly. What saves us? during those kinds of moments is our political process. 
The founding generation believed that one of the most significant things that they did for the future of the nation was creating a defined, documented constitutional process and setting it in motion. It's why James Madison took such careful notes during the Constitutional Convention, documenting precisely how the Constitution was made, not just for the American nation, but if other nations wanted to do something similar, he was sort of providing a guidebook. This is how we created a government. And as Hamilton wrote in the first paragraph of the first Federalist essay, most nations were grounded based on some combination of accident and force. Americans, according to Americans at the time, were trying something different. They were trying a process of reflection and choice. And they assumed that during moments of crisis to come, that this process, this documented constitutional process, set in motion through reflection and choice and grounded on debate and compromise, would hold the key to the nation's survival. It's really striking when you look at what the sort of founding folk said during moments of crisis in those early years, like the election of 1800, when people actually in two states were beginning to arm themselves in case they needed to take the government for Jefferson. So that was actually a very fraught moment. And when someone says to Jefferson, well, what would have happened if things had turned uglier than they did? And he says a version of what I'm saying here. He says, you know what would have happened? We would have had a convention. We would have tweaked and repaired the Constitution in whatever way it needed to be tweaked and repaired. And then we would have gone back to whatever it is that we were doing. Now, that's kind of Sonny Thomas Jefferson, admittedly. But that is a faith in the process. That's really a, lo a lot of what was going on in that founding moment. And I, I think I'm going to end with that idea, this idea that during moments of crisis to come, that generation assumed that the constitutional process, that the vital import, importance of constitutional governance, the process of governance during times of fraught politics would be what would carry the nation through. I end up thinking about that a lot myself these days, and I think I'll, I'll conclude with those words and open myself up here for questions. Thank you very much. Taylor, our Skettle colleague, is going to bring the microphone around if you have a question. Um, we do have a bit of a Skettle uh, tradition we are developing to let the first two questions or so at least be posed by students. And um, the general rule applies about brief questions. Please keep it brief and please do ask a question. <laughs> Feel free to raise your hand. Oh, I should, I should probably stand. Um, <laughs> so how does one begin to start deciphering this cryptic language that you find in the records um, without really good prior knowledge? Yeah, no, it's an excellent question. I, and, and I'll say that when I began this project, I didn't start out saying, I'm going to write about violence in Congress, because of course, I didn't know. Right? I, I knew, like everyone else, the guy, right? I knew about the caning of Sumner. Um, but I did want to write about, I, I do write a lot about political violence. I'm very interested in understanding how that makes sense to the people who are doing it at the time. My first book was about, talked about dueling and a variety of other things from an earlier time period. So when I set out to start the book, I thought, okay, well, I'm going to go jump ahead in time a couple decades to a period I haven't written about. I know that in 1838, one congressman killed another congressman in a duel. So I'm going to go to 1838. Someone's going to have to have something interesting to say about violence in 1838. And I'll start by looking at the papers of a congressman from the state of the fellow who got killed. He was a Maine congressman. So I will find a Maine congressman, and I will read his letters and see what he says about the fact that one of his fellows just got killed. And, what I, and he wrote this it, by dumb luck. He wrote every day to his wife, like every day to his wife. And as I'm sitting there at the Library of Congress and I'm reading his letters, so many of those letters described someone pushing up their sleeves and throwing a punch, or you know, someone knocking someone over, shoving someone. There was a lot of violence in his letters. And my first thought was, that's a really warped way to entertain your wife. You know, why is he telling her, what, what is this? Because it's not what I expected to see. But I began to write down what I saw. And then I thought, okay, either he's making it up or there's something here 
that I didn't know existed. So I began to read the papers of other congressmen. And I spent three months at the Library of Congress. In those three months, I never read a collection of a congressman's papers without finding violence. So I, with diaries and private letters, I ended up compiling a big list of violence. But so then I went to the record and I thought, how, how where is it? And that was when I discovered in the record the sort of, you know, there was a sudden sensation in a corner. And then the, the letter or the diary would say, so-and-so punched so-and-so and knocked over the desk, and I would be like, oh. You know, so the code was revealed to me by looking at the diaries and the private letters, and then once I understood the code, then I could read through the equivalent of the record and, and see what was there and check, you know, databases. I couldn't have written the book without databases. Then I could use, like, databases of newspapers to see what they said, and I could use databases of diaries, and, you know. So databases let me do a lot of hunting and pecking, but I really had to weave together the fights. I mean, part of the reason why it took me 17 years to write the book is because finding the violence, proving to my satisfaction that it actually happened, and weaving together the little weird random threads that added up to something took a, took a really long time. But that's a good question. I was interested in the matter of uh, if you had done any research on post-Civil War violence, and then as of, because I, I would presume it probably declined unless uh, there was less reporting of it. So I was wondering what the case of after the Civil War would look like, and then why do you think it declined, and similarly what perhaps motivates uh, a culture of political violence within others, as I can't help but think of other countries where there is still frequent brawls in a parliament. I remember reading about Ukraine having brawls. So. What kind? What can? What leads to this predicament to begin with? That's an it's an excellent question. And I will say, but given that I've been working for so long on violence in the U.S. Congress, I am like the, the clearinghouse center for anything bad that happens in any legislature all over the world. There's always <laughs> someone that's like, Joanne, look what's happening in the Ukraine. It's like, thank you. <laughs> Got a database of badly behaving legislators. Um, it's a really good question as to what um, when does it die down or what happens post Civil War. Um, the, I talk about that a little bit in the epilogue because that was a question that everyone said, which is, okay, so then there's the war, so then what happens? Um, and of course, in a sense, it's logical, right? So Southerners secede from the Union, they actually do that in Congress. It's, it's striking and moving when these Southerners stand up in Congress and say, my state is now leaving the Union, and they leave the room, and so people are in the galleries watching the Union disintegrate. Initially, there's some response to that. that the violence drops off, right? The Southerners leave, the violence drops off. The guys with the guns, many of them leave. There are New York Times editorials that say things like, um, it's really nice to be able to walk around the corner in Washington without your hand on your gun, right? The, the, it's calmer now in Washington, so the mood shifts. The, without the threat of duels, interestingly, the nastiness of the insults rises. It's kind of ironic that the people who uh, were duelists defended the custom of dueling by saying, well, as long as you think you might get shot in a duel, you're going to control your language, right? Because you're going to be responsible for your words. And interestingly, when dueling is no longer really a threat, the insults go off the charts. So in some way, I suppose you could say there was some warped logic to, to that. But what happens when the Southerners try to come back into the Union for a very brief moment, they bring violence back with them. But what's interesting is the shift in dynamics. So there's an incident in which um, a congressman, I want to say from Louisiana, there's a Southern congressman who feels it's taking too long for his state to get back into the Union. He feels insulted. And he lurks in the Capitol and attacks the congressman that he feels is standing most in the way of his state getting back into the Union. So it's in the Capitol. He canes him. He breaks the, his cane over the head of the congressman in the very same way that Preston Brooks had two friends standing by uh, with canes ready to help him if he needed help. This fellow has two friends who have guns standing by in case things get ugly. So it's this weird kind of echo of the Sumner caning, but the difference is the dynamics have shifted so fundamentally that the Northerners basically just respond by saying, what a bunch of barbarians. Do we want to let them back in the Union? What do you think? Like the, the power dynamic is totally different. So 
There's a little glimmer of violent behavior when the union is coming back together post-war, and it, it doesn't return to the way that it was before. Um, as far as what causes that to happen, that's obviously it's hard to say and make a big generalization about legislatures everywhere. Sometimes it has to do with the people in the legislature feeling that they're above the law or above the procedure, that, or it has to do with the fact that they no longer believe in the institution's ability to either protect them or get what they want. In one way or another, I think it has to do with a disjoint kind of relationship between the rules and what people want, but I, it's very hard to make big generalizations like that over all kinds of different cultures and, and countries. But it is worth noting, and at the point that you're making is a good one, that um, the United States is certainly you know, not the only place where that has happened. It still happens all over the world. That was just a moment in our culture when the United States was violent and Congress was violent as well. Thank you. Um, thank you for a fantastic talk. I really enjoyed that. I just thank had two really brief questions. One is you fleshed out the kind of sectional um, dynamics of this. I was wondering if there's a kind of partisan interpretation as well. I'm thinking particularly of the kind of old loyalties of, of Whig and Democrat. You know, Galusha Grow is a, is a Jacksonian. Does this influence his um, willingness to engage in violence? Do these kind of, you know, it's more difficult to imagine like one of the sort of cotton wigs kind of uh, <laughs> taking a, a gun into Congress or whatever. And the second question is, um, how does your work uh, tie in with kind of um, the scholarship on emotions and history of the emotions? So think of Michael Woods, Matt Mason, you know, the indignation meetings at this time. Absolutely. There is emotion in the 1850s seems to have a particular salience in political culture. So, so what's going on in the larger political culture? Um, why are people so willing to parade and make a big deal of violence at this particular moment in time? Okay, those are both excellent questions. Um, you know, it's interesting. Um, early on in the project, I had a fellowship at the New York Public Library, and I got up in front of a group of scholars to talk about the project in its early phases, and there was a very prominent Civil War historian in the audience, and he said, well, surely these are all Democrats who are pounding each other. I mean, surely the Whigs aren't doing this, right? And I said, well, no, they are, like Southern Whigs are, are actually doing it too, and they're armed, and this historian did this. <laughs> it's not what's supposed to happen. Um, and I, I think in that sense, regional custom, you know, one of the interesting things about the party system when it was in place was that it made fighting fair because both parties had Southerners and Northerners. So even though, in a sense, the principles of the Whig Party would suggest that they wouldn't engage in that kind of behavior, on an institutional basis, that kind of behavior had power and usefulness. and so. They did. I mean, even, even John Quincy Adams, right? You know, a, 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 this Whig who clearly he's not the sort of guy you're going to see like gutter brawling in some way, but he knew. So he, he's fascinating because he goes back to the House after he's president. He's former president. He's the son of a former president and a founder, and he's elderly by that point. So he knows that no one's going to be able to slug him. He's kind of, you know, punch proof. And because of that, he very aggressively and explicitly bullies people around him, knowing that they can't do anything to him. He basically constantly, like he'll say things and then, you know, kind of stand up and say, bring it. Like, really? You're going to do something? And no one really feels capable of confronting him that way. They're actually Henry Wise, good old Henry Wise. Um, Henry Wise at one point says, when Adams pulls that, like, I'm going to say an aggressive thing and then you can't do anything about it, because I'm John Quincy Adams. Wise says, you know, if you weren't who you are, you'd feel more than the power of my words. <laughs> and Adams writes in his diary that night, oh, Henry Wise threatened to kill me today. <laughs> so, you know, the, the, the Whigs were not beyond that, um, which is in and of itself interesting. The other question, too, is a wonderful one, which is about emotion. And Michael Wood's book was, I, I found it early on, and it was wonderful. And it does, this book talks a lot about the power of emotion, the usefulness of emotion, the deliberate deployment of emotion in politics, and the way in which emotion swept people into a particular kind of a political climate. And very much what I found in the course of doing my book was part of that world. On the one hand, it doesn't sound surprising to say that emotion is linked with politics, that emotion influences politics. What's, influenced, what's interesting about it is the deliberate deployment of it in ways that 
are being used because people want a particular political outcome. Right? So emotion as a, not just as a way to decode politics, which in and of itself is really interesting, but also emotion as a tool of politics, that's really interesting. And so, for example, just as you're saying, these indignation meetings, so after the caning of Charles Sumner, um, there are these meetings throughout the North which are known as indignation meetings, right, which is exactly explains what they are. Like, we shall be indignant here about what just happened to our congressmen and northerners in Congress, which sounds a little bit goofy, except that they were moments to express that kind of emotion, to encourage more of that kind of emotion, to display group display of that kind of emotion. There was a power to that. So uh, that was one of the things that really excited me. That's why when I referred to the emotional logic of disunion, one of the things that really excited me about the project was my understanding emotion and politics in a different way from how I'd understood it before. And the Woods articles and then his, his book actually were very helpful along those lines too. Thank you very much. Professor from the state. <coughs> <laughs> See, I was I was going to resist saying that, Paul, from Louisiana, and I, I oh, did oh. not bring my cane. Don't worry, <laughs> I left it at home. Uh, I won't say we've gotten over it. So my question is actually about the states. So first of all, it, it's sort of two parts. The first is, were there brawls in state legislatures or state legislatures? In other words, was this sort of part of legislative life, which would make it less obviously sectional or, or, uh, or it would just change the dynamic of that. And the second was just a particular question, did Lincoln ever see one of these or fight in one, do we know? And, and then secondly, it related to the telegraph in the 1850s. Of course, that's also the time of the Lincoln-Douglas debates. Well, this is an hour, you know, one speaks for an hour, the other for an hour and a half. Now, I, don't, I haven't read it with the code, but I don't remember fights in the newspaper accounts there. So is that because the differences weren't so great or fighting wasn't there? Or is it just a counter? This, this was something else that was going on at the same time that uh, the um, telegraph was exciting people. OK. Um, I'll see if I can address. You can catch me if I miss one of the, the questions. They're all excellent questions. But I'll start first with the states and the state legislatures. Um, there was some stuff going on in state legislatures, and, and actually in northern as well as southern. The northern legislature is a little bit later in time. Um, but you know, it is a fact that the United States was a violent place. Politics was exceedingly violent throughout this period. There's an incident I talk about in the book in Arkansas where uh, someone stands up in the Arkansas legislature and insults the speaker, and the speaker steps down off the platform and kills the person who insulted him. Um, and then is uh, re-elected, you know, I mean, he's, it, so he doesn't suffer for that kind of behavior. So state legislatures do have violence. Later in time, there's some violence in, I think, the Massachusetts legislature as the, we're coming up near the Civil War. But the newspaper accounts that cover it will say things like, um, I think this is pretty much a direct quote, there was quite a scuffle in the Massachusetts legislature today almost would have made an impact even in Congress. So people are making that kind of comparison. But there, but there was some. The difference in Congress, and this is part of what got me interested in the first place, is kind of the, the sectional component that the flavors of violence and the logic of the violence and the deployment of the violence, there were sectional variants of that. And so one of the questions that intrigued me at the beginning was, OK, so when you get a bunch of people in one room who, in a sense, speak different languages of violence, what happens? Um, and initially, part of the response to that, part of the answer to that is, well, the, the Northerners have something of a disadvantage, and they know it, and the Southerners know it too, and that's part of what um, I was writing about when I was, when I was talking about that. Um, Lincoln, um, he must have seen them. I mean, he didn't take part in one, but there's no, it's not as though that there was a moment when there was nothing happening, you know, so given that he was in Congress, some of that would have been happening. Um, but I don't know of his being involved. Um, and the fact of the matter, and it's a good point to make, it's not as though, although this was considered relatively routine, it's not as though it was constant, that kind of violence. It's more that it was always capable of happening. You know, I mean, the, the threat of intimidation, in a way, is the biggest thing that I'm writing about. The violence matters, but what matters almost more than that is the possibility of the violence. And so that's a lot of what the Southerners were kind of using was the, 
the, the power of humiliating someone or the threat of humiliating them and, and keeping people in line through that kind of a threat. The debates. The debates. The League of Douglas debates, anything on that? I mean, on there, violence or? Yeah, was there any violence there? Or no. Did we know about? Or it Not that I know about, no. What's interesting, though, is at a later point, you get to when, when there are public debates or public political discussions and things, I found a couple instances in which someone stands up, not necessarily in a debate, but is about to engage in some really angry, riled up public speaking, and then notes that there's a reporter for a, a, in the audience who clearly is going to go to the Telegraph and instantly report it. And, it. and at least one instance, the guy just stops speaking. You're not supposed to be here. And there, there is an instance in which um, someone says something in Massachusetts nasty about Southerners, comes back to Congress, and a congressman stands up and says, you know, the Telegraph tells me that you said this in Boston a week and a half ago. Do you really think you can say that kind of thing back there, come down here to Washington, shake my hand and serve on a committee with me? You can't. And so they're working that through, but they're, they're experiencing that, that kind of mix up of technology and debate. I was told in the back, I saw someone hold up a sign and said, five minutes, okay. Two more. Sure. Two more questions, okay. And no more of these two-part, three-part. Oh, or two, <laughs> that's a one-part. A one-part, okay. <clears throat> I was wondering um, if you could speak to, like, the continuity and change you see between, like, affairs of honor time period, 1790 to, like, 1805, uh, and 1830 to 1860 in terms of how is viol political violence similar? How is it different, though, between these two eras? That's a great question. So my first book is uh, Affairs of Honor is essentially about the, the, what I call the grammar of political combat. So how, how in those first 10 years of the government were people engaging in political combat? And I talk about dueling and newspaper attacking and all variety of other things. What's interesting in that first book is explicitly because you don't have defined parties, you have clusters of the particular friends of Mr. Hamilton and the particular friends of Mr. Jefferson, you, and people are unsure about whether parties are acceptable or not and no one wants to be part of one. In that kind of a world, there's a very personal component to it, um, which makes it, the dynamic of it's very different. It very much ends up being guy against guy. The later period, it becomes a tool of party politics in a way that it isn't. So I, I, in my characters in my first book are using threats, honor threats, in clever political ways, but not in the kind of almost regimented, organized, expected, like now what are we gonna do with it kind of a way that you see in that later period where it, it becomes more a part of politics. One more question? Okay. So how do we begin to parse out the extent to which this violence in Congress was a measure of polarization as opposed to being a reflection of culture? So. Can we find the silver lining to say, at least we don't yet have punches flying all the time in Congress right now? Or is it too complicated to say that because there were also cultural factors at play, as you talked about, uh, the culture of man-to-man, -man, showing that you're a man, showing that you're willing to fight for what you believe in, um, so that it's not simply a measure that things were so polarized that people were fighting, but that this was something you did to show the, you know, the courage of your convictions, was that you're willing to have a fist fight over it. Some of it is, is certainly, as you're suggesting, it's of that moment, and in that moment, that behavior made sense. And so you can't draw that kind of direct parallel and say, you know, well, this happened then, and thus we have to assume X about what's happening now. So it, it, as you're suggesting, some of it really is of that moment. Um, you know, it's very hard. When I first started working on the project, um, media outlets would come, and uh, they wanted me to say, they would interview me, but they didn't. They made it very clear what they wanted me to say was, ooh, it's never been this bad before, right? And I would say, well, yeah, they're not armed now and, you know, <laughs> not shooting each other on dueling fields and it's different. It's, it's a different dynamic, it's a different thing, it's, it's different. I think those differences matter. I do also think that in different cultures among different peoples and different moments in time, there are moments when the, a line is crossed into violence. Different. It's going to be different for different cultures, different times, different time periods. That's a moment, that's a thing to think about, is when that line seems worthy of being crossed. I, you know, I can't speak of that for the 
present. I can say that that's the sort of thing that I was looking at in the 19th century, and it was, not, it was a line that people very happily crossed over at a very early point. That's something that I think needs to be figured out you know, in, in the moment for this moment as to, as to what that means. So it's not a direct parallel, but it's um, clusters of things that happened together, you know, the, the, the list of things that sounded like I was describing now. You know, you can look at those, examine those kinds of things together and look at the impact of that and evaluate in the present as opposed to the past as to what the implications of that are. Thank you so much. I have just a few closing um, announcements and remarks before we uh, thank Professor Freeman. Uh, one is to remind everyone, uh, whether you're a university student or not, that the school is still new, and please spread the word. We have a major and a minor in civic and economic thought and leadership. We have a master's degree we expect will be approved uh, this year. We've actually begun to teach um, uh, courses in that master's degree focused really at classical curriculum school teachers and homeschoolers. It's a degree we call classical liberal education and leadership. I mentioned the two-day conference. Some of the speakers uh, for the two-day conference have already arrived in, in town uh, uh, Friday um, starting at 9.30 tomorrow morning, going all day, and then half day um, Saturday, Saturday from about 9 a.m. till uh, 1 p.m. Uh, much information outside um, included is our attempt to perhaps address sources of um, violence, but, but more to address ideals. Our version of a pocket constitution has the Declaration and the Constitution, Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, and Martin Luther King Jr.'s 1963 I Have a Dream uh, Address. Copies of those are available outside. And one announcement that we uh, will begin to make public uh, our attempt at addressing polarization. So the school is fortunate to have a very distinguished uh, advisory board of scholars. Um, uh, Catherine Zuckert from Notre Dame is here. Uh, professors from Harvard and from uh, Stanford. Uh, Arthur Brooks from AEI, who's going to uh, Harvard soon. Um, but we are announcing a new board of counselors, distinguished public servants and leaders in civic and political life to help us address uh, questions of polarization, restoration of civil discourse, and to advise us on how to mm -hmm. shape our civic education efforts and, and uh, spread the word. And we're delighted that Kathleen Kennedy Townsend, former Lieutenant Governor of Maryland, and John Kyle, former uh, Senator from Arizona, will be co-chairing that board and then we'll be announcing the other um, members of the board. So please pick up information outside. We hope to see some of you at the conference in the next few days. We have. Um, refreshments here. We have copies of, of the book available for uh, signing and signature uh, afterward. And with that, please join me in thanking Joanne Freeman. Thank you.